invite you to open a Bible to Acts chapter 20 as we continue our summer series going through the second half of Acts, looking at the life of the early church and especially the Apostle Paul. And as we hear from God's word this morning, we prepare our hearts and minds by going to God in prayer. Our first prayers for our own hearts and minds, the Holy Spirit would still them and open them to the hearing of God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would speak to them the words of God that would comfort and encourage them in their faith and their walk with Jesus. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully the scriptures and the word of God for all to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation in his name. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So as we look at Acts chapter 20, or a portion of it, the Apostle Paul has come back during one of his missionary journeys to the city of Ephesus, a city that he spends almost three years in, which if you read the story in the life of Paul, you'll know that's a very long time for him to stay in one place. It's the longest place he ever spends, and he's ministering to them, and now he gets to them, and he's saying goodbye, All right? Anybody ever had to say a heartfelt goodbye to, any, to someone before? No, you just are all just like, goodbye, and get out of my house, right? Like, and I don't just mean like the kind of goodbyes where I'll see you in a little bit, but you know there's going to be a, a space there, there's going to be a gap there, or in the case of Paul, you know this will be the last time we see each other or speak to each other, right? Many of us have experienced that kind of goodbye, and when we think about it, we tend to think about, I want to say what in those moments? Something good, right? <laughs> I, I want to say something good. I want to say something meaningful that, that I will remember, that they will remember, that I won't have any regrets about, right? That's usually our biggest fear in those moments. We're saying um, difficult or heartfelt goodbyes is I want to make sure that I say goodbye well, that what I say I won't have regrets about. And so in Acts 20 here in this scripture reading, Paul is saying goodbye to a church that he loves, that he has ministered to for three years and gotten to know and shared life with. And here it is. This is going to be his last sermon to them because he's telling us here in the text, this will be the last time I see you. Right, And if you read the rest of the story, you know that that ends up being true for Paul. He ends up being uh, imprisoned and set sails to Rome and imprisoned there and eventually dies there. So no one in Ephesus will ever see him again. And so this is his last sermon to this church. And he's going to be curious because what do you say when you're saying goodbye? What do you say when you're giving your last sermon as Paul to the church in Ephesus, right? And so he's gonna say, here is what is most important. And the reality of this text is Paul's gonna remind them of what's most important to remember in the church. And I'm gonna ask you a question that's gonna lead you to the answer, which is this. Who is in charge of the church? That's a great answer. I, I've taught you well over the last four years. Because we all know that's what the Bible says, right? And you're in church, so what are you going to say? The answer is usually Jesus, right? Like, anybody, right? like Even if you just do a Bible jeopardy in Sunday school and you panic, you throw out Moses or Jesus, you got a good chance of being right, right? Now, here's why I bring this up. We can all collectively say together, in church, we know the reality, that who's in charge? Jesus, right? Who does the church belong to? Jesus. Great. Now, how many of you are sinners like me? <laughs> Just a good camaraderie this morning, right? We know Jesus is in charge, we know we're not great. <laughs> Here's why I bring the fact up that you and I are sinners. Guess what we forget? A lot. Jesus is the Lord of the church. The church belongs to him, that he's in charge of the church. 
Now here's the other thing that we've got to remember when we say that the church belongs to Jesus and Jesus is Lord of the church. The church is the people. It's you and me. So when we say Jesus is in charge of the church, we say Jesus is Lord of the church. It's not just he's in charge of the building of our Savior Lutheran Church. It's not just, oh, he's in charge of this, you know, whoever's on the roster, who's ever on a list of names. He's also Lord of and in charge of me. Individualize it. I know collectively, yes, us together, but me and you and your whole life. And so in his final message, his, his deep departing goodbye to Paul, to the church in Ephesus, Paul is going to remind them in several ways to remember Jesus is the Lord of the church. Jesus is in charge of the church. The church belongs to him. That means you and me belong to him, and he is our Lord and master. So there's several ways Paul is going to remind us of how we as sinners can constantly come back to that truth. Remember it, because here is the reality. The great temptation is I'm going to be in charge. Anybody ever tempted with that attitude? I'm the master of my own life. I'm in control of all things. Or you're going to at least lie to yourself and say you're in control of all things while you worry about what? Not actually being in control. (laughs) Anybody ever been on that little treadmill? And so Paul's going to remind us, here's how you and I, as a collection of sinners redeemed by God's grace, to remind ourselves that Jesus is in charge of the church, but he's also in charge of our lives. So if we turn to Acts chapter 20, we're gonna start in verse 19. Paul is talking about his ministry in Asia, which is modern day Turkey, and he says this, that I was serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul had a pretty impressive ministry, if you're new to the Bible. He did a lot of amazing things. And there's all kinds of things that Paul could have brought up in this sermon, right? And he did raise someone from the dead, How many of you, if you did that, would brag about it to your friends? Like, look what I can do. And yet Paul, when he's talking to the church with all the things that he's done, all the things that he's accomplished, all the miracles he's done, he says, here's what I want you to remember. Here's what was at the center of my ministry in all of Asia, including the city of Ephesus, that I testified both to Jews and to Greeks. So verse 12 is saying, I testified, I preached, I shared the word of God with anybody and everybody. And here's two things, repentance towards God and a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's reminding them, here's what ministry, here's what the church is all about. Here's what the Christian life is all about. He's setting an example through his life and through his ministry, saying at the center of it, at the core of it, the foundation of it all is calling people to repent, to turn back to a loving father who welcomes them home, and to have faith, trust in the work of Jesus Christ and what he has done. Now, many of you are literally like, yeah, we already know that. You know who also knew that? The church in Ephesus that Paul had planted and pastored for three years. You know every Lutheran's favorite Bible verse? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you know who he wrote that to? These people that he's now reminding of them of what? I don't want you to forget. This is what church and ministry and the Christian life is all about. It's turning to God, a loving father who welcomes his children home and trusting in, that's what faith means, to put my trust in Jesus and not myself, what he has done for me through his death and through his resurrection. And when we sit in church, yes, if you, you're like, I'm part of the church in Ephesus. I know verses 8 and 9. I, I've got it memorized. It is so easy, though, for us to forget. We are constantly wanting 
to go in our own direction, right? That's the opposite of repentance. Repentance says to change your mind, to change your direction, and follow the way of God. How many of you do that all the time? Now, how many of you are brave enough to raise your hand and say, sometimes I walk in the opposite direction and go my own way, right? And so we go, oh, yeah, I already know that. It's, just, it's about Jesus and trust in the Lord. Right, and Paul's saying, but I need you to remember that <laughs> when you leave church. I, I, I want you to remember that when you're living your life and your faith out in the places that God has called you to. And then he says, I also want you to remember that church and ministry and the whole Christian life is about trusting in what Jesus has done. And it's so easy for us to forget that. I, I know you're like, I could never forget Jesus. And I know that. If I call you up later this week, I'm certain if I ask you, do you know who Jesus is? Most of you are going to tell me, yeah, I haven't forgotten yet, Pastor. And if you do tell me, like, you're confused, I'll talk longer with you, okay? It'll be a good phone conversation either way. But it is so easy to forget that that's what church and ministry and my Christian life is all about, is trusting in what Jesus has done. But Paul says he's made the center of his whole ministries. I've been testifying, I've been witnessing, I've been telling everybody, both Jew and Greek, that that's what it's all about because it is so easy to turn it in on ourselves. That was Martin Luther's definition of sin, by the way. He called it navel gazing, which is a fun little term meaning you're just staring at yourself the whole time. You're making it all about you. Rather than looking up to God, rather than looking out on your neighbor that needs your love and kindness, it just, it's all about me. Everything is about me. And here's the problem, when we forget that, we hurt ourselves. Because when, when I make it all about me, when I make whatever I call Christianity in my life all about me, it either leads to an incredible attitude of pride and arrogance and judgment because you will say to everybody else, what? I am better than you. Because if I make it all about me, which is our tendency as humans to do, to be self-centered, it will lead towards all kinds of pride and arrogance. I, I'm so amazing. Or the flip side, it will lead to all kinds of despair and desperation and hopelessness because it's like, I just... I'm never gonna fix myself. I'm never gonna get it right. I'm never gonna get better. I'm never gonna make up for all the things I've done wrong. And then it affects not just your life, but the ministry and the church. Because if I forget about Jesus, and I live in a way with an attitude of Christianity is really about me and my behavior and how good I'm doing, Guess what everybody's gonna hear and witness? Well, I guess what, that's what Christianity's all about then. Because what? They're gonna look at your life, they're gonna hear the way you speak, how you treat them, how you treat others, and guess what they're gonna think? Well, that's what church is about. It's about being good. It's about being moral. It's about being like this person. And so when we forget this, it doesn't just impact our, our own faith, our own walk in life but it also affects all of the ministry of the church. It affects our witness in the world. And this is why Paul's pleading with them. He's like, this is my last sermon. By the way, I've had to write a few of those. There's, they're not easy. This is not that, okay, don't like, this is not my last one, hopefully. By the grace of God, I'll be back next week, okay? I have had to do that. And like Paul, you are filled with tears and you're doing your best as a preacher. You go, this is the, they might not have listened to me for the last three years, Paul says. <laughs> they might have forgotten I wrote them a letter. So here's what I want them to know. Here's what my whole ministry is about at the root of it, at the foundation of it. Calling people to stop living for themselves and to follow God and to put their trust in Jesus Christ and not ourselves and not our own works. And so he goes on, he says in verse 22, and now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there. So this is lesson number two of what it looks like to do ministry, to follow Jesus. If he's in charge, who's not in charge? Let's just repeat that one a few times. 
Me, yeah, point to your, now you can point to yourself and do a little navel gazing, right? Me, I'm not in charge. Anybody ever play the old game, follow the leader, right? Anybody get annoyed with that game? Right, because every kid in that game wants to do what? Be the leader. So I used to work in a daycare for four years, and it was fun and terrifying all at the same time being in charge of 60 little kids. And anytime we played, it's also probably terrifying to the parents that they're like, he's in charge. All right, we would play follow the leader. It would take forever. And they called me Mr. Mark, because that was my name, all right, to show I was in charge. Mr. Mark, can we play? And I would do everything in my power to avoid that game on the playground. You know why? Because it wouldn't end until, guess what? Every single kid got to be the leader. We are navel gazers. We are self-centered. We want to be in control, and we want to be leaders. And Paul is saying in verse 22, I'm following Jesus, and he's telling the Ephesians that if you follow Jesus, he's saying, I don't know what's going to happen next. How many of you get nervous when you don't know what's going to happen next? You get a little anxiety or heartburn in your heart. You're like, (laughs) I want to... Right? How many of you just make up things? You're like, this is what's going to happen next, just so you feel a little more comforted, right? <laughs> I'm going to put something on the calendar just so it's not blank and empty, right? And this is what it means when we say, no, Jesus is in charge. He's the Lord of the church, and he's the Lord of my life because I am part of the church. Paul says in verse 22, I don't know what will happen to me next. What do you say? But I'm constrained, I'm controlled by, I'm led by the Spirit. This is what it looks like to trust Jesus. We are really good at trusting Jesus on the cross. Amen? Right? That is grace and salvation, and we need to trust Him with that. And because of that, how many of you are really good at trusting Jesus with your eternal salvation? Anybody? You're just, you're like, yeah, I I think it's going to be okay because he's got me, right? Amen? That is the gospel. Now, here is our foolishness, our hypocrisy, the irony of the human life. I trust Jesus with my eternal salvation. I just have a hard time trusting him with my Tuesday. Amen? Amen? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and everybody's like, I don't want to say amen, but it's kind of true. Totally. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He died on the cross to forgive your sins. He rose from the dead to give you the guarantee of eternal life. And every Christian goes, that's right. That's what it's all about. And then we get to verse 22, and Paul goes, I don't know what's going to happen next. And we're like, but you're Paul. <laughs> Shouldn't at least you know what's going to happen next? And here's how Paul lives his life. He says, but I'm constrained by the Spirit. Go where Jesus leads me, to do what he calls me to do. And then what you're going to see is that he's going to go to a place where he will be persecuted and beaten and arrested and eventually die. And Paul goes, but but the Spirit's leading me there. There's more people to tell about Jesus there. And so I've got to go. So the second part of trusting Jesus Jesus, yes, we trust him with our salvation. That is the foundation of faith. But when we say he's the Lord of our lives, he's the Lord of the church, he's in charge, it also means trusting him on Tuesday and Wednesday and when I don't know what's going to happen next on my calendar or in my life. But I'm following the Spirit. I'm following him leading me. And we jump to verse 24. And this will be another hard one. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. Now, let's just all be honest. When we're doing our navel gazing, <laughs> and we're looking at ourselves, and not, guess who thinks I'm awesome? <coughs> Me. I know it's not you, all right, but I do, right? <laughs> and, then, and you're like, oh, I'm, I'm great. I'm amazing. Look at all the things that I've done. Like, I'm in... Here's the other way. Maybe not so arrogantly going, I'm awesome and amazing. But I'm important. I deserve respect. I deserve to be treated 
with a certain level of respect and dignity, right? Amen. <laughs> right? We're like, I don't know. That's a part of confession, right? Admitting like, no, no, I deserve to be treated. I demand, I desire to be treated and looked at a certain way. And that all stems from what? Navel gazing. Self-centered and looking at myself. And because of looking at myself and how awesome I am and how together I am with it, I look down at everybody else and I think, well, I'm a little bit better than you, so therefore, you better treat me the right way. And by the right way is always an internal thing. <laughs> your, your own definition of the right way. And yet Paul says, I've made my whole life about Jesus. He is the Lord of the church. He's in charge of the church, which means he's the Lord of my life. He's in charge of my life. I go where the Spirit leads me, I could, even if I don't know what's going to happen next. And because Paul has made his life about Jesus and not himself, he's free from all the navel gazing. All that exhaustive work of looking down on others and demanding that they treat you a certain way. And so he's just free. Paul's free to go, my life counts for nothing. Now, if you were Paul's friend, how many of you would instinctually be like, oh, Paul, don't be so hard on yourself. I saw you raise that kid from the dead. I've heard your sermon. I read Ephesians. It's a good letter. Right? How many of you would do that? You'd just be like, yeah, I'm going to encourage my friend Paul right now. <laughs> you know why? Because we don't want that being the attitude. We were like, no, 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 no. Because if Paul starts thinking that way, I'm going to have to start thinking that way. Paul says, because Jesus is the point of my life, because he's the Lord of my life, he's in charge of my life, he says, I don't take any account of my life, of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only, right, this is how he gets free to think this way. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to do what? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What sets Paul free from the judgmental, navel-gazing, it's all about me, is not because Paul is awesome. He would even tell you he's the worst sinner. It's but because Paul has made Jesus his life. Paul has made the, the gospel of Jesus the whole purpose of his life. He's saying, this is the only reason I'm still around. The only reason I'm still doing things isn't to gain notoriety or respect or authority or anything else. He says, here's why I'm doing it. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul setting this wonderful example for us that if you make Jesus the Lord of your life and in charge of your life, you will actually finally be free. And everything in our spirit, everything in our sinful nature wants to rebel against that and say, no, actually I'm free when I'm in charge. I'm free when I'm the Lord of my life and master of my life. If you ever looked at the life of Paul and go, wow, he really <laughs> took a lot of punches, he took a lot of persecution and insults and he just kept going. I want to have, anybody ever thought to yourself reading the stories of Paul and other apostles going, I want to have a faith like that? I know I have. And Paul's saying, well, here's the secret to it. You just make your life about Jesus. You, you, you put Jesus as the Lord of your life, the master of your life, and you will finally be free to live because it, it won't matter how people view you. It won't matter to you what they say about you or think about you because you're going, well, I'm doing what Jesus has called me to do, right? Paul says, I want to do the ministry that he has given to me. You know, he had a different ministry than John and Peter and James and all the other apostles. So Paul said, no, I'm free now from the burden of defending myself and proving myself and and showing off to the world how amazing I'm. I'm free from all the possible insults and disrespect and disappointments of human relationships because Jesus is my Lord. And if he is my Lord, then the only thing I care about is more people knowing about the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So he's given us these examples of what it looks like to make Jesus Lord of the church. 
to make Jesus in charge of the church, which also means to make Jesus Lord of your life and in charge of your life. And at the end, he's gonna give some warnings of how do we, not just individually now, but collectively, and say here at our Savior, make sure we don't forget who's in charge. All right, it's not me. And now I know all of you are like, amen, pastor. <laughs> and here's the part you're not gonna like. It's not you either. It's Jesus is the Lord of the church. Can we all say amen to that? Amen. All right. Now we're going to look at what Paul says so we can always remind each other. Hey, <laughs> let's not forget. All right. He goes on in verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That is a really fancy way, if you've never heard that phrase before, of saying, I proclaim to you the Bible, the scriptures, the whole counsel of God. So here is a little bit of behind the scenes of preacher work. Okay? We have to decide what we're going to say in this pulpit. Did you know that? I have to like think about that and pray about it. Now, I do have one guy that I know that says he never prepares his sermons. He just walks in and goes, the Holy Spirit will take care of it. And God bless him and his ministry. I don't know how that's going for him. But <laughs> the rest of us need a little work. <laughs> All right. If you want to, after church, don't do it now. You'll hurt my feelings. You can take out your phone. You can Google something called Martin Luther's Sacristy Prayer. And essentially what it is is, oh, Lord, I need your help before I walk out there and do this thing called preaching. That's, that's the Pastor Mark shortened version of it. Okay. <laughs> but here's the tendency for pastors, because if you haven't figured it out yet, we're sinners too. A lot of preachers, a lot of pastors don't want to preach the whole counsel of God. You know why? Because I want you to like me. Anybody else have that struggle? Where you want, how many of you want people to like you? Okay, good, you're, you're, just, you're ready to be a preacher now. <laughs> That's the temptation. I want you to like me. So a lot of pastors, a lot of times the temptation is don't preach the whole counsel of God. You know why? Because it isn't always easy for the hearer to hear. You're not always gonna like it. We have to talk about sin and repentance. We have to talk about forgiving your enemies. We have to talk about serving. We have to quote Paul and say, consider everybody else better than yourselves. No one likes that sermon. I've given it. No one likes it. Right? And so what it means to preach the whole counsel of God, what it means for a church to be able to say, how do we stay centered on Jesus? Paul's saying, here's how you do it. You open the word. You read the word and you obey the word. That's what it means to proclaim the whole counsel of God, all right? When I was in seminary, I got points off on my sermons. They did not always give me 100. I know, you're shocked, okay. Now, one of the reasons they gave me points off on every sermon, and it's not, it's just a disagreement, okay? It's not bad, I love the seminary, good men there, all right? Is because my sermons always began with, why don't you open a Bible? And they go, you're going to need a better introduction, right? So when you take seminary preaching classes, you need what's called a hook to grab your attention, to get you interested. And all my sermons begin the same way. How many of you have memorized my introduction by now? How many of you can say it back to me right now? Go ahead and open a Bible. Yeah, I'm not doing that for fun. <laughs> I'm trying to make a point, not just for you, but for me, which is, this whole thing we call church together and ministry together depends on one thing and one thing only. Not my creativity, not my good ideas, but what Paul calls the whole counsel of God, what we call the Bible, the Word of God. And Paul's saying the only way you and I as a church collectively are going to stay focused on it's all about Jesus and his cross and pointing people to his grace and mercy and making sure that he is in charge of the church is if we stick closely to the Bible. And he goes on, and verse 28 says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Now, just remember the order here. Yourselves and then what? All the flock. 
which means you need to take care of your own repentance and your own sin before you declare your own personal ministry in the church, which is to go and tell others how bad of a sinner they are. Right? Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew to take care of the plank, the two by four in your eye, before you take care of the little speck of dust in your neighbor's eye. Right? And so Paul's saying, here's what you need to do. Pay careful attention to yourselves. Repent. Confess your sins. Turn to Jesus. And then we do it together as a church in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, not the church of whatever your name is. <laughs> See the difference? All right? The church is God's, not mine, which he obtained with his own blood. And this is the key of how do we as a church collectively make sure Jesus stays the main thing is that we continually remind ourselves and proclaim to one another the gospel of Jesus. Because this is how the church gets made, and this is how you and I become part of the church. Jesus purchased it, he obtained it with his own blood on the cross. A good way to remember that Jesus is the Lord of the church, he's in charge of the church, he's Lord of your life, he's in charge of your life, is to remember the gospel. That Jesus created and redeemed, obtained and purchased the church by his blood on the cross. And he did the same for you. He obtained you, he redeemed you, he purchased you, he saved you by his blood on the cross. So you and I become members of the church of Jesus, the church of God, not because you are really good and your job is to go out there and tell everybody else how good you are. Not because you lived an awesome moral life or because you cleaned yourself up after living like the prodigal for a little while and then you came home. You became part of the church of Jesus, became part of the church of God because of the gospel. Because Jesus died for you, forgave you, and then rose again to give you eternal life and a new family called the church. And if I remember that, and I make it the whole center of my life, I can live a life like Paul. I can make my whole life about testifying to the grace of God. And if we decide to do that together, of remembering the gospel every time we get together, of reminding ourselves, you have been redeemed by Jesus, you have been obtained by Jesus on the cross, and telling myself that and you that, we will be a church that makes Jesus the whole point. The temptation of our sinful, navel-gazing, selfish pride is to make my life about me, and to make the church about me and what I want. And Paul is saying, if you remember the gospel, if you stay rooted and grounded in God's word, you will make your whole life about the grace of God in Jesus Christ. If you remember the gospel together as a church, you make the whole ministry of the church about the word of God. You will make the church about the grace of God for sinners. And then you will actually change the world. Because Paul's saying, I'm gonna be leaving you know what happened to the church of Ephesus after Paul left? It stayed open. <laughs> it didn't close. They kept sharing the gospel. They became a center of the Christian faith for nearly a thousand years. Well after Paul was gone and dead. Now it did help that their next pastor was the apostle John. And I'm glad I'm not the third pastor at that church. <laughs> But you know why it stayed open after Paul died, after John died? It's because they kept it about the word of God, and they kept it about the grace of God, and they kept it about Jesus. So when people ask me, like, what, what my hopes and visions and dreams for our Savior is as your shepherd, as your pastor, we would keep it about Jesus and all the things that we do and say. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have made us part of your church by redeeming us and obtaining us and purchasing us with your blood on the cross. May we always remember in our own personal lives 
that good news of your grace and mercy upon us. May we make our whole lives about testifying to you and your love for sinners. Lord Jesus, we thank you for making us a church here in Kansas City. May we be a church that collectively testifies to the grace of Jesus Christ and his love for sinners. And then we pray, amen.